Today's scripture reading comes from 2 Samuel chapter 3. Now in 2 Samuel chapter 3, we pick up the narrative on a divided kingdom. You have David has assumed the throne in chapter 2, but he has only assumed the throne over the tribe of Judah, and uh, he is reigning in Hebron. He's been there, of course, he reigned there for seven and a half years. And then you have Abner, which had uh, taken Isbasheth, which is Saul's son, and made him king over the remainder of it. And what we have in chapter 3 is a, a bunch of moving parts. I have this chapter divided up into five sections. And uh, the first five verses, I have that titled as David's family grows and uh, his kingdom grows stronger. You see the verse pertaining to his kingdom there in verse number one. Now, there's long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. So you see two, the two different kingdoms really taking shape as God is blessing David's kingdom and God is bringing Ispasheth's uh, uh, down. And uh, then you see the remainder of these verses, verses two through five, deal with David. David is now has several wives. This time in Hebron, he just decides he's going to marry whatever comes along, I reckon, and he's having children with all these different women. Now, you will see that this presents bad problems for David later on. Not only David, but the children of Israel. Now, I want to point this out, that polygamy was, uh, oh, it was tolerated, but it was never condoned by God. And in fact, for kings, it was forbidden. And if you want to read about that, you can read about it in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 through 17 would be a good place for you to look at that. It was forbidden for kings to have multiple wives. So why did David have them? I don't know, because he could. Anyway. This mistake by David with these plural marriages to all these different women and all these different children, you will see wreaks havoc on him and the children of Israel later on. You see, whenever we mess up and we go against what God says, that the effects of that those, those sins don't are not isolated unto us, but they affect those around us. Verses 6 through 11 I have that titled, Upon Accusation, Abner Rebels. So what you have here is, it just goes straight into this nar narrative, and Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, and uh, Aya, excuse me, and Isbashesh, Isbashesh, Isbashesh. You say that three times fast. You'd mess it up too. Said to Abner, wherefore hast thou gone into my father's concubine? And then Abner gets all this righteous indignation about him, right? The, the fact of the matter is we don't know if Abner ever did that or not. Because if you did that, if you were going to go unto a king's concubine, whether that king was dead or not, doesn't matter. You are essentially um, taking a uh, 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 hold of the throne. We see that going back to David's kids, you would see that uh, one of David's kids did that later on. And you're essentially assuming the throne or laying claim to it. We don't know if Abder did that or not, but he might have done it, but done it, number one, because he could get away with it. And you see that uh, Isbasheth feared him in verse number 11. And he might have done it for this purpose, and that is, I look at Abner as a rat jumping a sinking ship. Abner sees, he's very politically savvy, and he's very well connected. He sees what's happening. He sees David's kingdom growing stronger, and he already knows that God had promised the kingdom to David, and we see that in verse number nine. So do God to Abner more also, except as the Lord hath sworn to David, even so I do to him. He already knew that God had uh, promised the throne unto David. And so now he may have done that to instigate his rebellion against Ispasheth and his alliance unto David. I don't know, you don't know, we don't know. But what we do know is that because of this accusation, 
And surely it wasn't unfounded. It had to have something behind it for just that accusation to come out about a very, very particular concubine. He used that to rebel against Ishbosheth and Saul's kingdom and unite unto David's. So uh, we see that in verses 6 to 11. Verses 12 through 21, I have that titled Abner Rally Support and then Meets with David. And what you see in this portion of scripture is kind of a back and forth. Abner contacts David and says, hey, man, I want to come on board. And Abner's like, okay, that sounds kind of good to me. He says, but, but, but. Uh, I want you to bring Michael, my wife, that I, uh, th- that, that's kind of a condition of this. You come, but you don't come without her. And he, in fact, he also sent, David also sent a message to Ishbosheth himself in verse number 14. It says, deliver me, my wife, Michael, spoused me for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. Now, what you see in verses 15 and 16 is really a tragic sight. I mean, I look at, I don't know what that was. Uh, I look at verses 15 and 16, and it is so sad because what you have is you have Michael was married to David, but then when David left, had to flee because Saul was trying to kill him, then Saul gave Michael to this man, uh, uh, Peltiel. Peltiel. I'm not sure how you say that one. Gave him her. And so Ishbosheth goes and takes his sister, that's Michael, and sends her to David. And the whole while, her husband is walking behind weeping and mourning that his wife is being taken away. It's really a tragic situation. Uh, First off, Saul should have never taken Michael and given her to this man. Secondly, what does David need another wife for? I know it was his wife, so what? David might have been doing it for pride. He might have been doing it for political purposes, uh, seeing that uh, Michael was Saul's daughter, and if he is now back married with her, then he has a claim to the throne by relation. I don't know why he's doing it. He doesn't need another wife. He's got too many as it is. But um, that's what he does. And so we see this going on, and then Abner meets up with David, and they have a good little time, and then then David lets Abner go in peace. And then that leads us to verses 22 through 31. I have that title, Joab avenges Asahel, Asahel and kills Abner. Joab was away when this all this meeting took place with David and Abner. And when he comes back, he hears the news. And he hears that Abner was here and he he met with David and he ate with David and David sent him out in peace. What is going on? Remember, kind of Abner's a rival general to Joab, but more importantly than that, Abner was the one that killed Joab's baby brother, Asahel. Now, um, Dave, Joab cannot fathom why David would do this. He does not understand why David would let the guy who murdered uh, his brother go, which is also, you know, as he was David's nephew, why he would let him go. And so he's just wroth and he goes out and he finds uh, Abner and he uh, kind of gets him over to the corner, says, let me talk to you over here, just behind the, you know, over here in the shade a little bit. And he stabs him under the fifth rib, same place that Abner had stabbed his brother to death, his little baby brother Asahel. Well, Here's the thing. These Joab is not thinking clearly. Joab is thinking purely on emotion. And whenever we think purely on emotion, man, we can make some really dumb mistakes. And that's what Joab did here. He's thinking purely on emotion to the detriment of the kingdom. Get that. To the detriment of the kingdom. Abner and David were were peaceably coming to be. The people, the nation of Israel was was getting ready to rally around David. The only obstacle now is figuring out what to do with uh, uh, Ishbosheth. But I, 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 that could have been handled amicably, I, I do believe. But here Joab goes and does this dumb thing. He lets his emotions outweigh the need of the kingdom. Christian, 
Man, we can be guilty of this. We can make decisions upon emotion. We can make decisions because, you know, of what we're feeling in a certain moment, not giving consideration to how this will affect the kingdom of God. Let us not be uh, guilty of that. Uh, so, and then also, Joab can't understand what the king is doing. He doesn't understand what David is doing. But Joab didn't need to understand what David was doing. Joab needed to submit to what the king was doing. Sometimes we don't understand what our king Jesus is doing. We don't need to understand everything that Jesus is doing. We just need to submit unto the authority and the work and the will of our king. All right, and then lastly, we're going to look at verses 32 through 39, and that is uh, titled, Abner is Buried and David Gains Favor. In these verses here, they go and gather up Abner. David is mad. He's ticked off at Joab and uh, his brother for doing this dumb thing. And he's mourning Abner because uh, he has seen Abner as, you know, he was a warrior for Saul and he fought for Israel and he gives him that respect. And he didn't die like a fool. He was killed by, by the hands of wicked men. Uh, in, in, in guile. And that's the thing. Asahel was, was killed in, in an act of war. He was chasing after Abner. Abner essentially killed him in self-defense, but Joab killed Abner as in, in a murderous treachery. That's how he killed him. So Abner's buried and David gains favor. I want you to look at verse number 36 and then we'll close. Verse number 36 says, uh, David essentially said, I'm fasting until the sun be down. In verse number 35, he's showing respect unto Abner. In verse number 36, and all the people took notice of it, and it pleased them as whatsoever the king did pleased all the people. David had a way of reacting in certain situations in a way that brought favor unto him and by proxy, favor unto his God. If you recall, when Saul died, David mourned and David lamented. And uh, the way that David reacted upon Saul's death, it gained favor in the eyes of people. So we need to make sure that whenever we are faced with situations, we're not reacting emotionally, but we're reacting in the way God would have us to react so that people will look upon not us, but our God and who we represent with favor. That being said, this has been 2 Samuel chapter 3. Hope it's been helping a blessing to you. Lord willing, we'll see you tomorrow.